everyone. My name is, is Jay Olson, and I'm a, I, I'm a researcher in this domain of the science of magic. And um, welcome to our, our uh, webinar on deception off stage. So we'll be examining how the principles of magic and deception can be applied or are applied in a bunch of these different domains in, in terms of um, health and, um, and uh, security as well. I'm going to try to um, demarcate uh, the boundaries how, of how magic can be applied in these domains, but also the, the limitations that, that it may have uh, um, applying it like this. So this is part of our uh, Magic Science and Society uh, webinar series run by the uh, Science of Magic Association. Uh, so our first speaker will be Dr. Patricia Kingori, and she's an associate professor in global health ethics at Oxford. And uh, she leads a research team on, on the topic of fakes, fabrications, and falsehoods in global health. And, and so she'll be talking about um, how, how deception offstage can be applied in the context of global health. So let's pass it over to Dr. Patricia Kingori. It's kind of seven o'clock in the evening here in London. So, um, well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, yeah, so um, as Jay said, I'm a principal investigator of a four year welcome funded project um, exploring fakes, fabrications and falsehoods. Um, my domain is particularly um, global health. Um, so I'm interested in looking at drugs and medicines. Um, I've only recently, I'd say in the past couple of years, really become um, knowledgeable about the kind of psychology of magic. Um, and so I'm really grateful um, to be part of this group. And I'm here definitely in a learning capacity to learn from you. Um, I've got um, just a few insights I wanted to share with you and I'd be really keen to hear any feedback that you may have. So one of the things I've become really particularly interested in is in um, fake medicines and fake drugs. Um, and many of you may already be aware, but um, fake drugs are presented as a huge problem in global health. Um, and at the moment, there is a considerable amount of effort on behalf of pharmaceutical companies to really draw our attention to the problems of, of fake drugs. Um, the, the issue with fake drugs is that we're actually not even fully aware of the scale of it, but what we're told is it's a problem and it's a problem that kills millions and potentially hurts and makes people sick. Um, and so I, I suppose the way I've been thinking about magic in this realm is actually the amount of attention that's given on fake drugs um, and thinking about that as a kind of a misdirection, because actually um, substandard medicines, expired medicines actually pose a far greater problem. And so on the one hand, we have huge amounts of investments um, and a misdirection, I argue, in relation to our attention on fake medicines. Um, and this is really to detract our attention from some of the infrastructural problems to do with actually how medicines are kept and how they travel. Um, actually, the, the, the lack of efficacy in, in many medicines. Um, and so I've been really thinking and um, with uh, the idea around misdirection to think about how, how, how valuable is this idea that pharmaceutical companies are actually invested in detracting um, our attention from actually the things that they can do um, to, to shore up the quality of medicines onto these, these problems of those sort of fake, fake drugs. So somebody's asked me in the chat by fake drugs, do I mean um, copying copyright drugs? And um, yes, that's the issue. And for, and this is, you can start to see where the money is, right? Because obviously for pharmaceutical companies, they're concerned about the money and the safety in these fake drugs. But I'm arguing actually that substandard medicines, so these are medicines that um, uh, become de depreciated in efficacy when they travel from point A to B. Um, they're supposed to be kept in a fridge and they're not, or they're um, supposed to be kept at certain, transported in certain ways and they're not. These actually pose greater problems to our health. And yet we are actually not given as much information as we should about these medicines and in fact told that actually these fake drugs are, the, are posing the biggest problem. 
And the reason why I think substandard medicines and expired medicines actually um, aren't given enough attention is because actually that this is a problem that's harder to fix. It requires much more infrastructural attention. It requires us to think through actually um, how are we going to work together to make sure that these medicines are transported from Holland to, I don't know, the Ivory Coast or from one part of America to another safely. And this is a problem that actually we should be paying attention to. You know, lots of medicines actually have a very, very fine range in, um, that, in which they're supposed to be kept temperature wise. Many of them are not supposed to be kept in sunlight and they are, and this is actually causing us in terms of antimicrobial resistance and problems larger issues so my issue, so one of the things i've been thinking through is actually um thinking through this issue of of misdirection so i really want to kind of open that up and hear what you what you think about um how i can extend my thinking on this okay okay sounds good thank you and uh, and uh, next up we're going to have um uh Kuhn Peters, who is a professor of uh, medical anthropology at the Institute of, of Tropical Medicine, and he studies the different uh, social and cultural factors involved in um, disease transmission and, and also prevention. Now, um, Dr. Peters is currently in a uh, remote forest in Sweden, and, and, and so he doesn't have Wi-Fi access uh, right now, but he uh, uh, recorded a short video that, that talks about um, um, some of the deception and maybe some of the the self-deception involved in, in some global health interventions and, and some of the challenges that, that caused in terms of measuring their effectiveness. So um, he sent a little video that we'll be playing here and uh, uh, Patricia Kingori will be able to answer um, uh, um, some of the questions that we have for, for Dr. Peters because uh, they both study in a similar field. Hey, um, good morning. Um, I'm Kuhn Peters. I'm a professor of medical anthropology at the Institute of Tropical Medicine. Um, if you see this pre-recording, it means that we cannot get online in the forest in Sweden or that we've been eaten by bears, but anyway, that we cannot make it now. Um, like I said, I'm a professor of medical anthropology, so anthropology is a study of what makes us human, more or less, so how we behave, and we look at this in medical anthropology in relation to health and illness. For example, why do people believe a COVID vaccine is actually a way of transmitting a microchip? Why do people use bed nets or not to prevent malaria or other types of diseases? And what are the consequences of all of this, for example, for disease control? So at work at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, we came to study um, magic or more concretely misdirection because of having the feeling of being misdirected ourselves regularly while working in global health. Because there's like an, an, a limited, uh, illimited array of methods or a huge variety of methodologies, approaches that we can use, but somehow we see we are always guided towards the same solutions. We're always guided towards the same approaches, while other completely valid approaches seem to be hidden or make disappear. So we started thinking about the concept of misdirection to, to look at that. Um, and when we started doing this, we thought we'd focus at least on conceptualizing it, following the following elements, eh? like our attention is guided, let's say, as it is in misdirection and, and magic, and focus in a specific direction towards a set of elements that are relevant to this magical effect or a desired effect, and away from other options, away from other processes that are hidden. And then this should be done more or less in a way that we do not notice it. Now, I will give a brief example of this um, for this talk um, in relation to malaria elimination and control and do this through a very simple object, which is the bed net. So malaria, as, as most of you know, uh, it's transmitted through by a mosquito, a female Anopheles mosquito that bites mostly at night and it transmits a parasite that uh, infects your red blood cells. So it's still a serious disease. It kills about 2,000 people per day, and mostly children and mostly in sub-Saharan Africa as well. Now, a bed net is a very efficient tool because when you are asleep, it stops mosquitoes from biting you. So it has been one of the great advances in malaria control of using these bed nets. And so these bed nets are distributed all across what we call, we call the malaria endemic world. So the, these areas where malaria is very common. 
and they're also expected to be used then in these areas by everyone. Maybe a little bit like if you think about the ma mouth masks for COVID now. So you were suspect you're, you're expected to use this, but you can see that not everybody is, of course, as happy about that. And in addition with a bad nut, it's not just like with during a pandemic, but you have to use it basically your whole life. So not everybody obviously likes using these nets. And sometimes these nets are also not just suitable in some areas. For example, if you're in very hot areas, let's say like Burkina Faso or similar countries, the nights are extremely hot. So in addition to the heat, you have to sleep under this net, which is even more suffocating. So some people obviously will not do this or people might sleep outside of their house half the night because of the heat and only sleep a little bit inside under a net. Now, this non-use, however, of, of bad nets is something nobody likes to pay attention to. So it's an element that is made disappear. And why is this the case? Because first of all, there are vested financial interests, of course, in all these uh, interventions as some people you have a procurement um, aspect to this, and some companies will um, invent, make, distribute, and sell these bad nets. But you will say we're in science, so all of this will be properly monitored and measured. And that is true, but nevertheless, we will look a little bit at how this non-use is made disappear. And a first way of doing this is that um, these this use is usually measured by asking people, did you sleep under a bed net last night? But the first problem there is what we call social desirability bias. Yeah? So asking people, did you sleep under a bed net last night? is basically like when the doctor asks you, did you finish your antibiotics? Uh, or, or somebody asks you, do you like my new shoes? So people want to give a socially desirable, positive answer. So these measurements are very biased. When you ask people, uh, did you sleep on a bed last night in a lot of these settings, everybody will say yes. We know this, but still we keep on measuring it. Uh, another difficulty is with this, did you sleep on a bed last night, is we do not inquire about difficulties of sleeping uh, under the bed net in different contexts. We do not want to know anything specific about a context because we want to measure this in a standardized way uh, across the malaria endemic world. So with this way of measuring it, it's actually very, very difficult to get an outcome of low use because of the social desirability bias. So you can easily measure it and be very happy about bad net use because very little people will say um, they are not using it because of this bias. Now, the reason um, I mentioned this is that it's not that there is no criticism or it's not that there are no other options, but nevertheless, somehow these other options are always made disappear so that we can have a nice standardized intervention measured in a way that only confirms or can only confirm the success of this intervention. So you draw attention away from all potential alternative solutions. Now, so this is a little bit my example. I know it's not that easy, but Methodologically, we see, uh, to sum it up, that all these interventions in malaria elimination are always globalized, standardized interventions that might not always work that well in specific contexts, but we really push those elements to the side. We really do not want to look at this because we want to have these global programs in which people can invest easier, that can be compared across the, across the globe so we can feel really good about um, having these um, programs that work. Great, and then moving from uh, the field of, of global health into the field of scams, next we have uh, Brian Brushwood, who is a performing magician, and he's the creator and host of various different shows, including National Geographic's Hacking the System, and also Scam School and Scam Nation on YouTube. So we'll pass over to Brian Brushwood. Yeah, howdy folks, I spent uh, 20 years touring colleges with a uh, punk rock blood and guts magic show. And uh, oftentimes schools would ask me to come back and do something else. And what that something else for me turned out to be a, a, a hour and a half long skeptical lecture called Scam Sas Sasquatch and the Supernatural, in which I would reveal some of the methods used uh, uh, by deceivers. Uh, and if there's one thing I've discovered 
uh, that 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 seems to be part of my calling is that I feel like there's a fundamental difference between academic knowledge of how a trick works versus visceral gut level reactions. Uh, at this point, we've done nearly a thousand episodes of Scam School. Now, in the, sh the case of this uh, YouTube series, the MacGuffin is how to win a free drink or get the girl's phone number, uh, wh whatever it is. Um, the important part is that we take real people from the bar, we show them a trick, hopefully it fools them, we have them learn how it's done, and then the all-important block is, as we call it, the C block, where they perform it back to us, because that's where you discover all of the mechanical problems or the fact that you might misphrase something in such a way. For example, it's very important that uh, you can screw up a trick uh, by, by just handing someone a deck of cards and saying, just cut those cards. They may end up shuffling the cards. You can't allow the audience to have that, that unguided control. So instead you hold the deck out to them and you're like, I want you to cut off as many cards as you want and set them on the table. Then you set the other ones on top of it. You begin to learn this ebb and flow of this structured program. And at all times, if there's one thing I've discovered is that nobody wants to be the sucker. And in, uh, if they have to choose, they're so afraid of being a sucker in the moment that they will much rather follow instructions and only discover they've become the sucker farther down the line. When I was first getting into magic, I worked at a movie theater. We were there at, uh, you know, I'm selling popcorn or whatever, a couple walks in. First thing is they split apart, they drag somebody down to the other side of the counter and the guy starts asking me for change for a 20. Oh, no, wait, actually I need change for a 50. And, uh, oh, no, 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 actually I don't need that. Let me get that back here. I've got these four ones. Let me swap that for, for, for this. And as it was happening at a visceral level, not an upstairs academic level, at a visceral gut level, I, I smelled the process of a magic trick. But of course, not wanting to be the sucker, I followed along with each step and it seemed like it all worked out and he got the proper amount of change. And of course, it wasn't until later that day that I found out that the register was $50 short and it was because I was so afraid to be the sucker that even though my gut smelled the process of a magic trick, I refused to engage with it. So at this point, uh, if there's one value to me teaching magic tricks online, it's that understanding that an intellectual understanding is not the same as a visceral gut level. And of course, we saw this back in the 1970s when there were people who were um, writing academic papers about a new type of uh, supernatural sciences. And of course, these are tricksters using uh, a standard magic trick. And they knew that it was possible to be deceived, but they would get far enough into the investigative process that the pain of becoming a sucker right then and there was so great that it's easier to just go ahead and actually publish and follow through with the entire thing. And so likewise, nobody wants to be midway through supplying, uh, 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 you know, in this case, medicines as we're talking about. And then, and, and even if they smell the process of a magic trick, nobody wants to be a sucker. It's, it's a bit like uh, the trolley problem in that regard, where it's like, you're definitely the sucker. If you say, stop, I think, uh, I think this is a scam, but, uh, but if you do nothing, then, you know, it's not your fault. Uh, you know, the train ran over all those people. Uh, so uh, my hope is that I can get enough people out there trying to score free drinks that they'll recognize the process of a scam when they see one out in the real world. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and I'm moving from the domain of, of scams into, into military. Our, our, our final speaker here will be Simon Henderson, who is a deception consultant. And he has done research and teaching and consulting on uh, deception and also counter deception. That is how to deceive the deceiver or not be deceived um, uh, by the deceiver in this way. And he's worked for the government, military and law enforcement. So we'll pass it over to Simon Henderson. Great. Um, glad to be here eventually. Um, I've spent over 30 years working in defense and security, primarily in the fields of deception and counter deception. And I'd like to share some very much personal observations about applying magic in this area. Um, there's a long history of magicians working with the military and intelligence organizations that feature people like Jean Eugene uh, Robert Houdin, Harry Houdini, Jasper Maskelin, uh, John Mulholland. And while I don't have time to elaborate now, it is important to recognize that much of that history is romanticized and exaggerated, and some of it is completely made up. 
Uh, nonetheless, magic can make a, a real contribution in this space. Planning a, a military deception operation or any covert activity is essentially a problem solving exercise. It involves starting at the end with the desired outcome and working backwards to establish the path for, for how to get there. That path is populated with deceptive techniques drawn from your own experiential repertoire, things you've done before and knowledge you have about uh, methods for fooling. And this process has strong correspondence with the design of a magic effect. Eisenhower said that plans are nothing but planning is everything. And this is very true of deception planning. In my experience, it's really the design of magic effects and less so their performance that can make a valuable contribution to defense and security. Some applications include things like organizational misdirection. So in magic, uh, an individual spectator can be misdirected by uh, shaping where their uh, sensory systems, human sensory systems uh, attend and point, uh, their eyes, their ears, their sense of touch, and for some effects, uh, taste and smell. Um, we can use conspicuity, movement, contrast, size, um, position, etc. Um, we can uh, create expectations in the, the audience member and also use our own attention to shape where the, the, the um, spectator is looking. All of these principles are scalable and can be applied to misdirect an organization. So uh, if you think, for example, there's a discussion about fake drugs before, if you think about how you might misdirect a criminal uh, drug smuggling organization and want to swap their real drugs for inert substances so that you can safely study and learn about their distribution network, Magic provides a, a set of building blocks and, and tools for stimulating thinking about how you might design that kind of operation. And in fact, swapping out drugs is done quite regularly. One of the ongoing concerns in modern military deception relates to hiding real troop movements and showing false uh, troop movements in the context of technologies like satellites, sensor networks, mobile phones, and the internet. And some people believe that these types of things can no longer be done. I fundamentally disagree. Every new technology is certainly a threat, but it's also an opportunity and a conduit for strengthening the illusion. In 2008, Operation Okwab Suka, or Eagle Summit, uh, that uh, occurred in Helmand Province, uh, was the largest military deception operation since the Second World War. It involved over 4,000 uh, personnel, and it involved successfully portraying uh, false troop movements to seduce the Taliban's attention away from a real operation that was transporting a 200 ton um, hydroelectric turbine to the Kajaki Dam. So these things can still be done. Um, I'll also mention the fact that I think magic has a lot of applicability in the classroom, especially for teaching counter deception. Um, I've been involved in teaching military and intelligence staff um, to observe and deconstruct magic, uh, in particular the crisscross force, uh, in order to learn a structure for detecting and unpacking any kind of deception, including uh, military and state level deception. And magic provides a fantastic means for students to experience being deceived themselves in the classroom setting and using that experience to uh, help make sense of how deception works. In terms of challenges, just a couple of things I'll, I'll mention. Uh, Jim Steinmeier talks about uh, magicians guarding an empty safe as a consultant in this area. Um, part of my job has involved selling the safe, uh, which is very easy to do, magic sells itself, but you also have to deliver on its contents. And the simplicity underlying um, the way in which a lot of magic works, and it's very counterintuitive, uh, a lot of that simplicity, can sometimes make it very difficult to get clients to buy into the viability of using things like misdirection, dual reality, and attentional blindness. Um, try to sell the idea that you can do something in plain sight, plain view uh, of um, an observer without them seeing it or recognizing what's happening uh, can be very challenging sometimes. And as a consultant, I think I've suffered from what I would call the curse of secret knowledge. Uh, there's also been some discussion uh, on this forum about the impact of pseudo-psychological claims. 
I think Chris French mentioned it. I know Gustav and Nurse have done some sterling, uh, made some sterling efforts in this, this space. But um, I can attest that these uh, types of claims do create false expectations about what is potentially achievable. And even organizations are not necessarily immune from believing these types of claims. The very last thing I'll, I'll finish on is that this is a very serious business. It's about conducting real world, uh, sorry, conducting action in the real world against real people, and that has very real consequences. And legality and ethics is paramount to everything I've spoken about. Uh, so in summary, uh, MAGIC continues to have much to offer to defense and security, but with some very important caveats and limitations. Um, uh, so the first question that I have, I guess, focusing more on 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 the uh, uh, global health uh, generally, um, uh, Patricia was talking about um, these these uh, these kinds of uh, uh, fake drugs that you have, and um, I, I'm 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 curious what you see the link of um, in 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 terms of sometimes we know that um, if if a drug is is not effective, it can still have a a helpful placebo effect, and so uh, and, uh, and 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 so how do you see the tension between uh, the the fake drug not being helpful compared to a placebo, but still may have this absolute uh, placebo effect, say if it's expired or just um, no longer has an active component. Um, I actually think that the relationship between fake drugs and real drugs and the, the marker that's used, the threshold for fake and real is really fascinating to me. So if a, a medicine has um, below I think it's like 25% of its active product ingredient. If it's uh, if it has less than 25%, then it's considered to be um, fake, right? Um, but actually, if um, often when you have substandard medicines, if so, they leave the the manufacturers by the time they arrive. Um, to the point where the patient's taking them, they've been tra traveling so badly, maybe the, the trucks aren't refrigerated or they've been sitting in a shipping container for a long time, the paperwork wasn't ready. Um, you can have a substandard medicine which has an active product ingredient of 20% by the time it arrives to the patient. So in many cases you can have, in some parts of the world, you can have fake medicines which have more active product ingredient than the, than, than the real medicine. And so for me, that is the relationship I'm really interested in is the, is the um, way in which our attentions are diverted to these fake medicines when in fact some of these medicines can have more of the active product ingredient in it than the real thing. And the people who produce fake medicines um, purposefully have them just above the threshold um, that they need to be to be classified as fake. So if the threshold is 25% active product ingredient, they might put in 30. Um, if it's 30, then they might put in 35. Um, so you have this kind of way in which the, the people who are forging the medicines know that the, um, the technology in a way isn't quite uh, able to detect fully whether something is, is real or fake. And the question around the, somebody mentioned about the temperature gauges. So um, there is a way to, to see whether um, a medicine has, has breached its, its um, the conditions that it's supposed to be carried in. Um, by the, so you can have attached, often it's a sticker. And if that sticker turns to a different color, then you know that it's, ha it's, it, it's been out of its temperature range. But increasingly what we're finding is people who forge these medicines also are forging these stickers so that the stickers themselves um, show you that they haven't breached temperature ranges. And all this needs really is just for people to, uh, for pharmaceutical companies to invest way more money than they currently are prepared to do to ensure that these medicines are, are, uh, travel safely. Um, but at the moment, our, all of our attention is looking at the fake versions rather than actually the quality of what we're ingesting in, in the real version. That sounds a, a, a bit like these, uh, these common kind of races that we see in different fields of deception, where there's the deception and the counter deception and then the uh, response to that. And then you keep on going from there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it occurs to me that uh, uh, heretofore, we've not necessarily differentiated a discussion of magic versus 
what in economic forms they might talk about nudges or, or in the advertising world, they may talk about, you know, various psychological closes you can do. Uh, the difference with magic is it's one of the few art, art forms that, that by its very label is a press release that you are entering an adversarial forum. You are walking into the theater to play chess with someone. Now, there are different philosophies in magic. Um, uh, uh, magicians, part of the reason that so many of these um, uh, magicians who have consulted for wartime efforts have, have loved to vaguely talk about their magic skills is because it makes it seem all the more mysterious. It makes their shadow longer. Um, uh, uh, the, the way I think about it, uh, and part of the reason I teach magic on the internet is because um, uh, uh, there are two ways I, I, I personally feel like the job of the magician is to wander into a village, AKA an audience to announce, I am the best chess player here and then take on all comers. And then by checkmating, by removing all of the possibilities of how to do this naturally, now they're left with wonder they've been checkmated. Uh, now there are two philosophies for this. There are some magicians that uh, believe like me that, well, the way to be the best chess player in the village is to study all the book moves, study all the moves of the greats, give, work on your opening game, your mid game, make sure you know uh, how to handle various aspects of the end game. Uh, but, but historically there, uh, there have been an, uh, the dominant other philosophy is, yeah, what if we just never told anyone in the village how to play chess? then we could swoop in and always be the world's best chess player. And so in that regard, uh, I do like focusing on magic specifically, not on uh, advertising or, or, or con men or any of that stuff, but in an adversarial relationship of storytelling that causes people to honestly believe that it's their idea. Um, uh, and, and in that regard, I think magic is different from, you know, uh, psychological studies like uh, Robert Cialdini's influence and that kind of stuff. So uh, on, on the topic of, of, of training people with magic in, the, in these different domains, whether it's, it's, it's students or, or the military or something, um, is, um, is there some possibility that uh, from, from somebody learning this, they would have um, some kind of, uh, of overconfidence that, that would be problematic and that they can still be fooled by things, but they would just be fooled by different secrets than, um, uh, than what would normally fool the public. Um, so I, magic, I, we sometimes I, have these like, magic tricks for magicians. So is it, is it just shifting in, in that sense? I, I would say 100% yes. And this is uh, my personal philosophy and what I'm trying to put into practice. Uh, this is that difference between knowing something upstairs versus down in your gut. Um, uh, there, there was an effort uh, in the 70s when there were so many uh, psychic fraudsters that, um, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 for all the wonderful work that James Randi has done, uh, he had a habit of wanting to preserve the secrets and he felt like just duplicating the effects of somebody uh, and saying, but I did it without any magic, without any you know, supernatural powers was enough to, to fix the problem. And, and, and I personally believe, no, 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 you need to have, it's not even enough to study and to know all the methods because then you get to file it away of like knowing that it is possible. Uh, the only way to recognize it, to catch it in the moment is to actually practice the deception. Uh, uh, when we did a hidden camera show where uh, we were going to pull off some classic scams. I had read these backwards and forwards. All of that was very different from looking a human being in the eye and lying to them with the intent of trying to bilk them out of, of $50. I, uh, so I, I totally agree with you, Brian. I'm, I'm very struck by uh, something Bart, Barton Whaley uh, said, a, a word to the wise is seldom sufficient. Just having knowledge is not sufficient. Some, you need to do something differently, um, either think differently, understand your environment differently, and act differently uh, in order for um, real change to occur. The, the awareness alone is, is, is not sufficient. So your idea of them doing the scams for themselves, I think, is is critical to, to real learning occurring. And, and, and once, that, uh, once that sense, it's almost like a kinesthetic sense. It's something I'd imagine a talented dancer or musician is able to do. Then you're able to go back and long after enjoying the amazement of a good magic routine, uh, there was one routine that I held on and managed to keep myself fooled for about a year. And then I pictured step-by-step step being the person doing the routine. And then there was one moment that I pictured, yeah. And then he reached in with two hands. And I was like, why would you reach in with two hands? I'm like, to hide the fact 
that it's only one hand and there's a mirror. And, and, and that's the kind of thing that, that only by, by kinesthetically picturing that you're there uh, uh, will, will it occur to you. Uh, a general question here from, from Stuart in, in terms of um, uh, um, counteracting more, more um, negative deception. Um, I, I, I guess this is the question for all, all, all three of you, if you have comments on this. Um, um, uh, the question from Stuart is um, whether the um, um, solution to these kinds of, uh, of negative deception is to um, reduce the capability of the deceiver or to increase the capability of, of the target yourself. And so are, are like you trying to reduce the deceiver's power or um, um, increase uh, the power that, that the target uh, would have? In terms of counter deception? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think a, a beginning point in, in terms of what counter deception consists of is firstly being able to detect and recognize when deception is present. And then the more difficult issue of what to do in response. Um, now, that can be done in terms of um, looking at training and enhancing the capability of uh, individuals or organizations who are potentially subject to being deceived. Um, if you look at organizations that uh, deceive other organizations, criminal organizations, for example, then clearly it's not just about understanding that they're being deceptive and what they're doing, it's about intervening. Uh, in order that those organizations can be uh, stopped and prosecuted. So I, I think there are opportunities for, for, for doing both in terms of looking systematically at the, trying to solve complex problems, uh, but counter deception typically tends to focus on the detection and response to deception on the part of the, the target of that deception. Certainly that's my take. Mm. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from a Gustav, for Brian, um, uh, I, I talk about scams over, uh, um, over time. Do you think that 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 people um, over time, like uh, um, over the decades, have become uh, more more skeptical uh, about deception and, and therefore more uh, immune uh, to the deception? Do you see any? No. As, as, as a matter of fact, I would say uh, uh, very very strong uh, strongly that uh, uh, the more certain you are you cannot be deceived, uh, the most certain you are to be deceived. I mean, understand that magicians are all junkies looking for one more high. We all got started in this because we got fooled as a kid. And now people spend tens of thousands of dollars to fly across the world to see, you know, like for example, FISM is basically considered the Olympics of magic. Uh, we're all just junkies desperately hoping to be fooled one more time because we know it's possible and it's so ecstatic when it happens. And um, uh, I do think that the, the, the powerful folks are the ones who know they could be fooled and who, even as they try to recreate, I, seconds after an event happens, the moment I begin to start talking about it, I know that I am rewriting the narrative and I have to be very, very careful about my words and keeping that on track. That is something that magicians feel no shame about because they swim in those waters and it's how they make their living. Uh, however, people who read a, a book of how deceptions work, um, again, we're, we're, nobody wants to be the sucker. Nobody wants to admit they can be fooled. Magicians are among those who are first to admit. I can be fooled very, very badly and I can misremember things very, very quickly. And uh, I think the quicker we, uh, especially uh, in positions where they're, the stakes are so high when it comes to, uh, you know, are these drugs legitimate and that kind of thing, we have to, we have to speak as peers of people who are willing to freely admit how easy it is to be deceived, how memory is malleable after the fact, how uh, even, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, again, it goes back to nobody wants to be the sucker. And so uh, that's why we read books on, this secret is exposed. Congrats, I'll fool, I'll fool you two years later when you now misremember how that secret is done. I think, uh, uh, sorry, I think my wife is a bit choppy, but um, in, 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 terms of, in, in terms of global health generally, I, I, I guess this is a topic for the three of you. Um, a question from um, Alex here. 
um, what do you do when you show somebody the, the solution? Like uh, um, say you, you show them how they're being, being deceived and then, and then they don't accept that. And, uh, and, and how, how might this kind of uh, play a role in, in terms of um, some of the misinformation that we, we've been seeing around the pandemic? That one sounds like it's above my pay grade. So anyone who wants to take that one. <laughs> it's also above mine. Um, but I think, uh, I think that's such a good question because what we believe now to be the case um, in, in relation to the pandemic um, has been decades in the making, right? So where we believe the truth comes from or where we, where, where we believe fakes come from or where we believe, who we believe are the people that aren't, aren't tricking us these are things that have been decades in the making. So now to try in a matter of 18 months to say, actually, you know, we, we've been told to look one way and actually, actually something else is going on over there is really difficult. And I think, you know, what we've seen, I'm thinking very much about sort of Irving Goffman's work here, there have been a few slippages where really established people like The Lancet, for example, have had to hold their hands up and say, actually, you know, so some of the things you've seen that have been going on backstage, we didn't want you to see, right? These are things that we've always, we've always known exist, but we didn't want the people front stage to know. And people have still not really lost, um, I think some people are probably a bit more skeptical, but people are still very invested in these institutions, okay? We are very invested that if a medicine is produced in one particular country, that medicine is real. And if it's produced in another country, it's more likely to be faked. And that's not going to change overnight. I don't think, even though actually we can prove, we can prove, we can show you proof that that belief actually is, 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 is wrong. Um, you know, we've got two vaccines that Oxford AstraZeneca one and the COVID shield, both made in exactly the same factory. It just got a different name. One's the Indian version. The other one is the Oxford version made by the same people, exactly the same ingredients. And one of them at the moment isn't, uh, doesn't have um, EU approval and the other one does, right? And a lot of this is to do with uh, kind of geography of authenticity, geography of credibility. It's really difficult to get people to believe things even when you say to them, this is exactly the same. So I think, and these are decades in the making, there's a strong historical lineage in terms of where we believe real things come from. So I think that's a really good question. How do you change the way people think when so much is invested in, in how we think at the moment? Uh, th th this may be a bit of a just so story and I may get the details wrong, but um, there are certain magic tricks that are so good they fool yourselves. Uh, one, uh, during the 1800s, uh, dowsing was extremely popular. The ability, the belief that you could detect certain minerals by holding a pendulum over, uh, let's say a bowl of mercury, and you have, uh, you know, Michel Eugene Chevreul, a French scientist who is uh, like, okay, what's up with this dowsing? Give me a bowl of mercury. And he holds, uh, and you could try this at home. You know, you, you hold a, a piece of string with a weight at the end. And uh, just thinking of forward and backwards is yes, a circle is no, uh, you know, holding it over it, he's able to see it going forward and backwards. And, he you know, he's, he's not the one doing it. And then he takes an empty bowl and sure enough, starts spinning in a circle uh, and uh, it will clearly there's something to this. Uh, but 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 this is, as I have heard the story, which you guys know more than me, um, uh, sort of the origins of what is now commonly accepted as the double blind practice. He had an assistant set down behind a partition, either an empty bowl or a bowl filled with mercury. And once he didn't know what the expected outcome was, uh, he, he realized that unconscious idiomotor responses were were causing that. Um, uh, that's the type of thing that 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 awareness, that deep awareness of our own psychological uh, 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 gaps, I, I think, is the biggest thing uh, that that I think more people should uh, um, uh, uh, be aware of and, and not feel any shame. None of us feel any shame when we look at an optical illusion where we draw two lines of the same length and then one, we have the arrows go out, the other one, we have the lines going in and one of them looks better to us. However, that's not a psychologically loaded deception. That's not, a, that's, that's not an artifact that we're ashamed to admit that we see. However, when it comes to buying medicines that may be placebo or uh, for example, um, uh, uh, refusing to look at 
the double blind research because we, yeah, but still this one's made in a country that I have preconceived notions about. Those we are ashamed to admit that we have these biases about. Uh, and and uh, that's the part that I would love to, to see us participate less in. I, I think this um, issue about people studying deception being just as vulnerable as other people uh, who that haven't studied deception is is very true, and I uh, agree that uh, being aware of all the ways in, in which uh, deception works um, just really serves to make you more aware of the rich ways in which you can just as easily be fooled as anybody else. To not be fooled uh, requires moving from a, a a sort of passive state of autopilot. A lot of the time we, we work on autopilot and are highly vulnerable. If one moves into a more active state where one is paying a lot more attention to the things around you, critiquing what's uh, around you, questioning things, being curious, then potentially one can detect and be less um, vulnerable to, to being fooled. But that is an effortful state to be in. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to do that, and it can't be sustained for a long period of time. So I think part of the challenge is knowing when to switch between the passive and the active states, being aware of the very early indicators that you might need to become switched on and uh, very conscious of your environment and studying the, the information and the actions around you. Uh, so this... Um, active and passive states, I, I think potentially can um, provide some basis for, for reducing opportunities to be fooled. I, I wonder if there's not something there in terms of like uh, 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 having a terminology where it's like it's part of one's job where it's like, hey, I'm going to need you. I mean, I'm going to need you to watch for a magic show, you know, going into a certain thing because you're right. It's we like to believe that um, understanding certain things about magic is like an enlightened state. And now we will never be fooled by that thing again, but it's only when you're switched on. It's like, you know, just because you bench press, you know, 200 pounds once doesn't mean you're, you could do it all day, every day. Patricia, I'm really interested okay. in um, what um, both Simon uh, and Brian have said. Um, and I really like this idea of, you know, really thinking and, and trying to, um, you know, thinking about the idea of, of being aware and being conscious and being observant and, 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 and thinking through things and being critical and being a critical thinker. And these are all described in this space as something that's really positive. Um, but what I'm finding in my space is actually those are the people who are being categorized as conspiracy theorists. These are the people who... Um, uh, you know, to be sceptical at the moment in this pandemic times is actually a pejorative term. People consider it, people consider you to be someone who, you know, it's the sort of 5G conspiracy theorists, so it's the, it's the people who, um, you know, think, um, you know, the sandwich board, the, world, the end of the world is nigh. And so actually, it's, it's more about where do you find spaces where this is actually considered a valuable attribute? Um, Yes, I just wanted to open up. You, you, uh, you know, I wonder if, uh, and it's easy for all of us to just wish that there was more resources for everything, but I wonder if, let's say, there's a transaction happening and you're buying some, uh, uh, some medicine, and um, whenever there's a buyer and a seller, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes the buyer wants to get the best deal and the seller wants to get the most money. And maybe they're concealing the fact that these are expired, but they swapped out the uh, labels or something like that. Um, and I, it's probably not helpful for me to just wish for this, but I wonder if a third party auditor might not be an interesting thing. Somebody who doesn't know anything, but is watching for uh, uh, you know, those micro expressions or, or, or asking the questions, you know, like uh, I, I, uh, there's something about a double redundancy. Of, uh, I wonder if we can double blind these transactions in a way where like, for example, right now we all know what brand of, uh, of vaccine we're buying at any given time. And, and part of me wonders if that's good or not. Part of me wonders if, uh, if, if, if we're not just taking our preconceived biases going into it, and as a result, um, uh, I, I don't know, I'm just wildly speculating at this point. 
I, I think your um, point, Patricia, about um, sort of conspiracy theories and you know, skepticism uh, potentially being a, a, a dirty word, I think it's actually worse than that because a lot of conspiracy theorists or those who promote conspiracy theories suggest that uh, people that have an interest go out and do the research for themselves. Um, they're actually encouraged to be skeptical. They're encouraged to go and look at information uh, and make up their own mind. Um, and that can create uh, what's referred to the, the deflationist perspective on uh, self-deception. I mean, there are various theories of self-deception, um, but one of them is, is referred to deflationist, and that involves essentially biased information seeking, where you have uh, an idea about something that's of interest, you search for information on that, and that points you to more information. Suddenly, all your information that you're looking at, even though you are actively being skeptical and critical, um, but all of your research is getting the same messages, uh, and so consequently, your belief can shift um, based on what you believe to be skepticism and independent research. Uh, there are other also uh, sort of useful theories of, of how self-deception works that uh, tackle things like the compartmentalization problem. Can I know the truth and the falsehood at the same time? Uh, and also motivationalist perspectives where um, the desire for something to be true can overwhelm uh, a false belief, uh, sorry, a, a real belief. So you end up with the, the false belief. But it, um, This is the part that terrifies me the most is uh, the idea of becoming bubbled, where by virtue of just Googling once, vaccine skeptic, all of a sudden I'm led on the first step to a path that has me believing in a flat earth or something, you know? Um, uh, and, and, and I wonder, uh, back to this idea of, uh, uh, you know, auditing, uh, I, I, I don't know, I don't, you know, th there's cause to, for some people to question uh, even the people who are skept, you know, who, who are fact checking things. Uh, I, it's, 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 it's a very challenging question because you get this, the satisfaction of knowing you verified a fact through a fact checker, but now, yes, you've alleviated that fear of being a sucker, but, but your information diet can be awful and not even know it. And, and uh, I, I, I wish I, again, this is another one above my pay grade. I, I, can, I can find the ace of spades though. I think this idea of being the fear of being a sucker is so is such a a great way of thinking about this, and it's so it's such a great way now of thinking about this. Everyone is afraid of being the sucker, especially in relation to the pandemic. You know, everyone is afraid of being the person that either gets the wrong vaccine or, you know, is wearing the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing, um, not getting the right type of information. Um, and this, I think, and I think you're absolutely right, and it's really helpful the way you've categorized it, Simon, this idea of, you know, being encouraged to go and do your own research. Don't worry about the fact that it's taken people, you know, several, you know, years to learn how to do research properly. You can do it yourself, you know, and it's sort of DIY research mentality um, is leading to all sorts of problems in terms of the stuff that we've discussed here, the confirmation bias, um, and creating all these blind spots and also I think um, really creating sort of these sorts of dopamine um, highs when people get the information that they want they think they they want that confirms to them that these things are happening um, and somehow that they've tricked the system and they're not the sucker because they've got this this piece of information that they wouldn't that was being kept from them you know so there's this real sort of artificial kind of cat and mouse game that's going on at the moment of information where people think things are being kept from them um and you know and and the, and they're now fee feeding off this sense of getting these crumbs here there and everywhere which i think is a really great way of thinking about this so thank and, you uh, for, for for anybody who wants to do a little more poking around you can see statistically very clear uh, anomalies for example in a clinical game back to that um uh, optical illusion where it's like you, you don't have any dog in the fight of whether one line looks bigger than the other uh, uh, you're able to acknowledge that that you're you're being fooled. But meanwhile, when there's a lot on the line, when you're on national television, for example, there was the uh, I, I think it was a, a British show, uh, Golden Balls, that basically ended with a version of the prisoner's dilemma, and they noticed a, a strong statistically significant bias towards people being willing to give up thousands of dollars in order to not 
trust the other person and end up looking like a dupe on national television. And so it's that it's that uh, aversion to to being a sucker that shows up. Um, uh, oh, I had a second example queued up, but I've oh, uh, uh, similar. To, you know, I I, I think it's uh, uh, this is again speculation from a guy who does card tricks, but uh, uh, you know, with uh, in economics. We, we see that with the endowment effect where it's like, hey, will you give me $5 for this uh, mug? No. Uh, hey, here's a mug. It's a gift. Can I buy it from you for $7? No. I love this mug. And, it, you know, that that makes no sense. But again, uh, these are these are the flaws that right now are stigmatized, especially because there's emotional content to them. But uh, but hopefully we can move beyond. I, I think that uh, focus on emotion is... In, in my personal view, relatively, compared to many other topics, a relatively unexplored area in the field of deception. Uh, the fact that everything we're talking about involves high emotional content. When you're in a heightened emotional state, uh, you are spending time processing that emotion, and that takes away cognitive resources from being able to process your environment more accurately. Um, and also um, predisposes you towards uh, certain biases in the way you can, can process information and collect information from the environment. Um, there is some research around the, the, the role of emotion, but I think it, it's quite unexplored in, in my personal view. Yeah, that is one of the challenges with the, um, uh, uh, the academic study of, of deception, where um, the, the the field has uh, has progressed in some ways, looking at the the detection of, of deception, but there's still a lot of controversy there. Like we were talking about about the micro expressions, there's still a lot of uh, of controversy regarding that. Um, and and the field hasn't necessarily focused on how to um, um, effectively deceive people, and so that's kind of like this uh, um, academic. Uh, black hole, uh, black hole right now, where sometimes there's more to be learned from the the magicians uh, or or the con artists or or the people who are um, using uh, uh, using this kind of stuff. And so, uh, I, um, yep. I, I, well, one parting thought. Uh, uh, I got I, I got into a bit of a row on a radio show once because I made the mistake uh, in front of another magician. Magicians themselves really like to perceive themselves as being capital I important in a lot of ways, but uh, personally. I see magicians as folk scientists. We're, mm -hmm. we're farmers, we're agrarians. We haven't figured out uh, Punnett squares and dominant and recessive genes yet, but we know what works and, uh, and we do it year after year. And uh, I'm really excited to see science continue to actually you know, break down the, we, if, 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 for all the magicians who are claiming they know why it works, none of us know why it works. And I can't wait for smarter people than us to figure it out. Yeah, definitely. So uh, magicians know how to fool people, but they don't know exactly why. Oh, why these things? Why work. it works? That's think, right. Yeah, yeah. And I think the folk psychology um, is is the good way of putting it because magicians have passed on all this knowledge about how tricks how tricks might work, um, and and some of these are based on true understandings of cognitive mechanisms, and and some of them are based on misunderstandings. At the end of the day, you can still fool the person, so that um, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter as as much, but. Um, I think the interesting th thing to be studied is, uh, yeah, why are people fooled by this? Um, what, whether it's it's magic or or or, or misdirection in, in, in military or or global health or all these in between, and and so we're hoping that the field of um, of of academic deception um, um, eventually starts exploring that in in more detail. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our our speakers here. Thank you, uh, Brian, Simon, and Patricia, for these for these thoughts. Thank you.